Hi. Hi, everybody. Hi, Toby. Hi, Telespark Science Center. I'm so excited that you all came to listen to talk about polar bears today. I'm really excited to tell you a bit about this incredible Arctic animal, and I'm excited to hear your questions. We really want you guys to let us know what you want to know about polar bears. So please do use that chat function uh, to put your questions in, and I'll be taking a bunch of questions at the end, but I am going to keep an eye on, I have my phone down here that all your questions are going to come up on. So please shoot questions anytime and we get to all them if not of them. My name is Elisa and I live in Whitehorse, Yukon right now and I'm a polar bear scientist. So I've been working with polar bears since about 2010. I focus a lot of my efforts on polar bears in western Hudson Bay and that is a population that's off of Manitoba in Canada and it's one of 19 different populations around the world and I'm going to talk a little bit about that later. But I feel so fortunate that I've been able to study polar bears and that now I work for Polar Bears International and I get to still research polar bears while also talking to kids and adults all around the world about how an animal is and why the Arctic is so, so cool. I'm also very excited to talk to you about International Polar Bear Day. And that's part of what we're doing here today as we're celebrating second, Polar Bear Day. Uh, are we having trouble over there, Toby, or is everything working okay? I think we're back. Got me. Toby, can you hear and see us? Can you hear us now? It's under, sorry, let me change our, we went back to the name. Emily Ringer, thanks for hanging in there, everybody. We'll go back to PBI here. Um, while we're getting the screen going, Elisa, there was a question about polar bear skin. Is it actually black? Yeah, polar bear skin is actually black. We don't really know why, but we think that maybe the black helps absorb the heat a little better uh, and it can keep that warmth more, which is of course very important to polar bears who live in a very cold environment. So any little bit of extra warmth helps. Can Did everybody hear that? Are we good to rock on? These questions are amazing. I am keeping an eye on them. Back for real. Okay. Let's try this. Are we spotlighted now? All right. Elisa is We back. are. Yay! We We're Break spotlighted. That down. Yay! Um, thanks so much for your patience. We'll dive back in here. We're so excited. This is KT behind yeah. the scenes. So um, we were, we left off, I think Elisa was talking about being a polar bear scientist. Yeah. And you know what, I'm going to finish that thought and I'm going to roll through some content I have pretty quick and then dive into questions as soon as I can because all these questions are fantastic. <laughs> so let's just get rocking and rolling. So uh, we do wanna celebrate International Polar Bear Day. It's this Saturday, February 27th, and we have events and an art um, experience on Saturday and social media and all sorts of things all week about polar bears if you'd like to learn more. And then this is part of that experience as well is having these live events about polar bears. So I do wanna start with a little pop quiz and I hope that you guys can put your answers in the chat and I bet all of you know the answer already. The question is, where do polar bears live? A, the Arctic, B, the Antarctic with penguins, or C, with pandas? Where do you think they live? Arctic, Antarctic, or with pandas? What do you guys think? Can you pop your answers in the chat here? I think most of you know where polar bears live. That's right, great questions. Polar bears live in the Arctic, so they live in the north. There are no polar bears in the south. Polar bears and penguins do not live together, uh, but polar bears live 
on the top of the world and they roam Arctic sea ice. That's their habitat. This is a marine animal, if you can believe it. Polar bears are the only marine or sea bear of all the eight bear species. They so, so much rely on Arctic sea ice as a platform. They would prefer to never be on land if they didn't have to. They would just live on ice their whole lives. And they are also the biggest bear on the planet. Now, all of these things are for a reason and that's because of their diet. So one more question for you, what do polar bears eat? Why are they on the ice and why are they so big? Do they eat? fish or whales or seals or eggs or something else what do you guys think polar bears eat can you put your answers in the chat box again do they eat fish or whales or seals or eggs let's see what what we have coming in here think about that for a sec you guys are nailing it yeah, almost everyone, seals is their main food. So polar bears are mostly a seal eating bear. This is their number one prey species. They eat mainly bearded and ringed seals. What you're seeing here is a ringed seal because these seals are also the seals that live in the Arctic. And these, this is a bearded seal here. The bearded seals are a lot bigger and the ring seals are a little bit smaller. And ring seals make holes all around the ice so that they can come up and breathe when they need to. So they swim underwater, come up and breathe. And polar bears will sit by those seal holes for a very, very long time being so patient. And then when the seal comes up to breathe, the polar bear will pounce and get that seal and pull it out. And polar bears eat seals because they rely on a diet of blubber to keep them healthy and happy in the Arctic. And that's because blubber has some of the most calories of any food on the planet. And that means that it has a ton of energy. And polar bears need so much energy for living in a very, very cold, harsh environment. The blubber, which is a type of fat, helps give them all the energy that they need. And they eat a lot of blubber. In fact, if polar bears are you know, not too hungry and they're eating pretty well, they won't even eat the seal meat. And they'll just leave the meat on the ice for other things to eat like foxes or birds. And they'll just strip off the blubber and move on to the next seal. So they're very much a blubber eating bear. And because of that, they are the most carnivorous bear. So most bear species eat a lot more vegetation. Brown bears and black bears, which we also have in Canada, they eat a, quite a mix of different meats and fats and veggies and fruits. Polar bears really, if they had their way, would only eat fat. So that's a pretty interesting fact about polar bears. And we can see that in their bodies, we can see how well adapted they are to this environment and to eating seals. So I wanted to show you a couple items I have here. One is uh, the claws. So polar bears have very, very sharp, thick claws. You see how there's a very sharp point here? And they're very thick. These claws are perfect for giving them grip on the Arctic sea ice and perfect for gripping into seals and pulling seals out of the water. Now compare this claw to the brown bear claw. So this is a grizzly or brown bear claw. It's a lot longer and duller. And that's because grizzly bears walk on land and they do a lot more um, like digging and pulling over logs. And this claw is much better suited to living on land than the very sharp polar bear claw that's much more suited for catching seals. And we also talked about how polar bears have to keep warm in the Arctic and they do this with their fur. So unfortunately you can't really see the black skin on this piece of fur, but this is a piece of polar bear fur and they have two layers of fur. So they have this really thick, dense under layer that's close to the skin. And that's like us wearing a very wooly thick sweater. And then over top, we have these longer hairs, and these are like, like a raincoat over top of the bear. So these are whisking away water and wetness and weather. And between these two layers of fur, the polar bear can stay nice and warm. One interesting thing, though, this fur is not actually white. Polar bear fur is hollow and clear, and it just looks white to our eyes. The hollowness helps trap warmth in the hair, again, keeping them nice and warm. Now, polar bears do have a thick layer of body fat, thanks to all the blubber they eat, but the body fat is a better insulator when they're swimming. So body fat helps keep them warmer in the water. It's really the fur that helps keep them warm when they're walking across Arctic sea ice in freezing cold temperatures. And polar bears are comfortable at minus 40 degrees Celsius or even a bit colder. When it's really, really stormy, they might hunker down and kind of make a little day bed and just kind of ride out a storm, but really they're comfortable when it's so, so, so cold. It's amazing. 
you just saw that bear in that video yawn there. That's one interesting thing they do. They, he could just be tired, he could need a nap, but polar bears might yawn also when they're trying to smell. And here's an example, this is a polar bear skull. This is a mold of one, this is not a real one. You can see in his nose here, see all those ridges? There's so much surface area in that nose. Polar bears have an amazing sense of smell. They can smell their prey a mile away if the wind is right. They absolutely can have amazing noses to help them find food. And if you think about being in the vast Arctic sea ice, you need a good nose to find your next meal. And check out these teeth. Look at how big and sharp these teeth are. Again, this is a carnivore's teeth. These teeth are meant for grabbing seals and pulling them out of water. And you see this little gap between the front teeth and the back teeth? That's perfect for catching a seal head and pulling it onto the ice out of the water. So polar bears are absolutely a bear that need to eat seals. They need to use Arctic sea ice to find those seals. We had one question about polar bears swimming. Polar bears are amazing swimmers and they can swim for very long periods of time and they can stay fairly warm while they're swimming, but swimming burns so much energy and it takes a lot of energy and they lose weight when they swim too long and it takes a long time to dry off. And seals are way better swimmers than polar bears. So it's really not possible for polar bears to just swim around and go hunt seals. They really do need Arctic sea ice to go find their prey and grab those seals out of the water. So we've talked about how polar bears are at the top of the world. Now they live in five different countries across the Arctic. They are broken down into 19 different groups of polar bears. That's really just so us humans can kind of manage them. But the five different countries work together to share information about polar bears, to research them, to protect them, and to conserve them. And Polar Bears International works in most of the countries. So the countries are of course Canada, and we are home to two thirds of the world polar bears. So the majority, which is pretty cool. There's also Alaska in the US, of course, Russia, Norway, and Greenland. And Polar Bears International right now is working in the United States, Canada. Uh, we have partners in Greenland and we're working in Russia and Norway. So pretty fantastic. We're trying to be really collaborative and share knowledge because polar bears are hard to study. They roam in these vast landscapes really far away from where most humans live. And so we have to share our knowledge. And I'm gonna talk about some of the research we do in just a minute. So of course, the sea ice is very important. We find polar bears where there's sea ice and where there are seals. And sea ice is not just ice though. So I think sometimes it gets overlooked as such an amazing habitat, but sea ice is so critical to what's going on with polar bears. It's their home. If we don't have sea ice, we don't have polar bears. But if we don't have sea ice, we don't have the Arctic food chain. Sea ice is to the ocean what soil is to our forests. So sea ice, because it's salty when it freezes, it freezes with all sorts of cracks inside. And inside those cracks, little tiny micro plants form. And then little organisms eat those plants and fish eat those organisms, seals eat those fish. And then we go all the way up to food chain to whales and polar bears and even people that live all across the Arctic. So we need Arctic sea ice in the North to really have a functioning ecosystem to keep polar bears healthy, but to keep this entire Arctic food chain healthy as well. And those northern communities of people also rely on healthy Arctic ecosystems and stable Arctic sea ice to also find their food and to live their stable lives. But we are concerned about what's happening to sea ice. So we are seeing a decline in Arctic sea ice, both in how much of it there is and in how thick it is. And this is because our world is warming. And what's happened is that humans learn how to burn what we call fossil fuels for energy. And this has been really important to us growing as humans. We use fossil fuels, we burn them for transportation, heating and cooling. We burn fossil fuels like coal, oil and gas. But when we burn them, we release carbon emissions into the atmosphere. Now in regular amounts, these carbon emissions, that's okay. Uh, they form a heat trapping blanket around the earth and regular amounts, or a regular amount of warm. But what we've done is we've burned too many and we're burning rampant amounts of carbon emissions. We're releasing rampant amounts of carbon emissions and we're thickening this heat trapping blanket around the earth. So we're getting too warm. And when it's too warm, of course, ice melts. And we're seeing a lot of things happen, but what we're talking about right now is Arctic sea ice declining. So we have seen a loss in Arctic sea ice over the past few decades. And this does concern us about polar bears. Now, the Arctic is not all the same. Um, polar bears in different areas are experiencing this at different rates. 
But what we do know in areas that we have seen a lot of sea ice loss, such as in Hudson Bay in Canada, we are seeing fewer polar bears and we're seeing fewer cubs being born and we're seeing smaller polar bears. It's simply harder to find food when you don't have as much sea ice. And we predict that if nothing changes, uh, by the end of the century, we could lose you know, a good amount of polar bears. We could lose maybe half polar bears de depending on what population we're looking at. So we don't want to see these huge declines in the polar bear population. Um, again, in Hudson Bay, Hudson Bay could be ice-free by mid-century. So the great thing about knowing this, though, is that we know when we know why something is happening, we know how to fix it. And so I'm going to talk to you about all sorts of solutions and what people are already doing to make sure that we keep polar bears in the Arctic for a long time. But it's not only polar bears, again, that depend on Arctic sea ice, the entire globe does. So this is not an Arctic problem, this is a global problem because Arctic sea ice is also our air conditioner. Arctic sea ice, because it's white and big and cold, it reflects sunlight away from the earth and that helps cool the entire planet. So it really helps cool down our whole world acting as our air conditioner. And when we start to see declines, we heat the earth more. So anything that we can do to help reduce the amount of fossil fuels we're burning, to change over to cleaner energies like solar and wind, to be more efficient with the energy we are using. And the more we talk about it with each other, with our leaders, with our parents, with our friends, with our siblings, these are all great things that are good for polar bears, they're good for sea ice, and they're good for us no matter where we live. And that's a big thing that Polar Bears International tries to talk about. We advocate for polar bears, we try to inspire people to take action, but while we're talking about them, we want to make sure that we're also doing boots on the ground stuff and we're researching them and finding out more about polar bears because the more we know, the better we can do at protecting them. And that's something that's really important to us. So I wanted to talk to you a little bit about a couple of research projects we're working on, specifically a couple that have to do with moms and cubs, which is pretty exciting. But I wanted to ask you more questions again. So I've got two more questions for you about moms and cubs. So do you know how many cubs does a polar bear mother usually have at one time? Does she have one, two, or five? What's normal for a polar bear mom to have? I'm gonna check if you guys, oh, look, you guys are so smart. You get a lot of answers here. Yeah, most people are saying two. That's great, yeah. Most often polar bear moms have two cubs at one time. Sometimes she'll have one, sometimes she can have three, but most often we see two at one time and it's really great. And those cubs will stay with mom for almost two and a half years before they get weaned and go on their own way. And so mom will have a new litter of cubs about every three years. And she'll give birth to those cubs in a den. So why would a polar bear den? Give birth to cubs, provide a safe place for cubs to grow. Do you think male polar bears den? Yes or no? Would there be any reason for a male polar bear to den? Hmm. Other polar, other bears den, brown bears hibernate in dens, black bears hibernate in dens. No, no, polar bear males don't den actually. Polar bears don't hibernate like other bears, which is so interesting. Only the moms go into dens to give birth and other males and other bears, if they don't need to, they don't go in a den. Again, they might dig like a day den for protection, but they don't hibernate like other bears. But Still, the moms and cubs are some of the most important bears in the whole population because they're so vulnerable and it's so important that they be healthy and that these moms are able to raise their babies up and send them off into the adult world to be successful adults of their own. And their world is changing so fast and so we really wanna protect uh, these bears. So that was just amazing footage from a den cam that we have, um, that the Columbus Zoo has and shared with us, which is really great. So. At Polar Bears International, we have a couple great den projects right now. We have a maternal denning project in Norway. And this was built off a project that started in Alaska. And basically, we really are interested in how moms and cubs are doing. Norway's had a lot of changes go on, especially with where bears can den. And we're curious on how healthy the families are. But we don't want to disturb them at all. So how do you study an animal without bothering that animal? Well, we can go up to Norway and we have a couple staff members that have developed these den cams. And when we know where a polar bear might be denning, either maybe she has a GPS collar or someone local knows where there's probably a bear denning, our team can take one of these den cameras and they can, they can fly in with helicopter or go there on a snowmobile, 
close enough, but then they'll go in quieter, closer to the den. They can snowshoe in or walk in. So there's no noise bugging the bears and they'll set up a den cam a ways away from the entrance of the den. So they don't get too close, but they get close enough so that the camera can watch the polar bears come out. And they'll set these cams up before the families are set to come out. So usually right around now, and then they'll leave and they won't go get those cameras again for probably a couple months. And when the family does emerge, the cameras are able to gather the most amazing footage of what's going on. The cameras can run on solar and fuel cells. So even when it's super, super cold, they keep running. And we go back and collect all the footage and download it and sift through a lot. And then we come up with imagery like this. So this is a mom who's emerged from her den with her cubs. And we get to see how healthy the mom is. How, how good does she look? How good do her cubs look? How active are they? What, where are they heading? And we learn so much about families this way in a way that doesn't bother them at all. And it's such amazing research to be able to do. I'll just let you watch these cubs for a second. They're just too cute. <laughs> Another fantastic project we have going on um, that's similar, but it's looking at the dens even a little earlier than this. So we are using a type of synthetic aperture radar, I'll just call it radar, uh, to actually see through snow, to see the families underneath the snow. And this is because in a lot of areas across the Arctic, more and more humans are doing more and more activities. And we want to make sure that when we're doing activities in the north, we're not bothering these polar bears. Again, it's so sensitive for moms and cubs. But how do we know where they are? We don't always know when polar bears are under the snow. Well, with this radar, we can put a certain special camera on there and fly over these dens and we can look through there. So current technology, we miss over half of known polar bear dens, but this technology we hopefully will be able to see to through that snow dens. better and detect where these dens are. And then we can tell anyone doing activity in the area, like people looking for oil or things like that, we can say, hey, there's moms and cubs here, you gotta stay away and they will do that and they will respect those families. So we are working on this SAR project, we call it, uh, to help protect moms and cubs even more. And I just wanna talk to you about a couple more quick things and then I'm gonna take all the questions I can. Um, I also want to let you know we have a tracker on our website, the Polar Bears International Bear Tracker is a very cool way to learn a bit about science and polar bears. Every year, a certain amount of polar bears are tracked in the Hudson Bay region. Uh, the ones you see on the tracker are females that have GPS collars, but we are also tracking males and subadults, so those are the young bears, with GPS ear tags. And we are trying a new technology that actually sticks on the first. So we've got a few different ways to track polar bears but you can go online and see where the polar bears are every week, see how they're moving, compare their movements, and we can learn so much about what different polar bears choose to do throughout the winter on this bear tracker. It is really, really neat. Um, and then I also wanted to talk to you about our education programs that we have. So this is one of them, but we of course have our polar bear cams. I don't know if you've ever heard of our polar bear cams. We also have a Northern Lights cam that's active right now and a Beluga cam all out of Churchill, Manitoba, Canada. So we run these cans. Some of them are year round, um, but the fall is a major time. This is the Northern Lights right now. The Northern Lights cam is spectacular. This is the big Northern Lights season. Uh, but with these cams, you get a peek into the live, the lives of people in Churchill, but also the lives of polar bears every fall. So in Hudson Bay, polar bears have to come onto land in the summer because the sea ice melts. And of course, if there's no sea ice, what are you gonna do as a polar bear? You're gonna come hang out on land and they're not eating when they're on land. Uh, they're just hanging out, they're pretty bored. Uh, sometimes we see them play wrestle, but a lot of what you see is just this, the polar bear hanging out in the willow. But when it starts to cool down and when we hit October and the bears know that winter's coming back, they start moving toward the shore of Hudson Bay and they're waiting for their sea ice home to refreeze. And so we can go there and we roam around in tundra buggies. So we there's a set of trails in Churchill outside of the town and you can drive very slowly on these tundra buggies and you can watch the polar bears. And right here is tundra buggy one. And this is our polar bear monster truck mobile broadcast studio. And we have a camera on it and you can watch polar bear action for months while polar bears are around. And as soon as the sea ice comes back, the bears leave. But this is a really great way to, again, not bother the polar bears because they're free to leave or come. Some really are interested, some are not. But you can watch amazing polar bear action. And while we're doing that, we're also talking to people around the world about why these animals are so, so, so cool. So we love those cams. Please go check out our partner's website, explore.org. If you're interested in the cams, ask your parents. They've got all sorts of great animal cams from all over the world. And with that, 
I just want to play one more video for you and then take questions. So I've talked a lot about what's going on with polar bears. You know, Arctic sea ice is declining, but we know what we can do about it. We care about polar bears, but we also care about the Arctic and we care about protecting our own futures as well. What can we do, especially what can youth do? Uh, we've got a great video here about you know renewable energy and using your voice and how you can get involved and take action in whatever way works for you. And we're going to play this and then we're going to come back and I'm going to just start taking polar bear questions. Future generations of people and polar bears depend on the decisions and plans that we make today. The key to getting the climate back to functioning the way it should and to preserving a future for polar bears across the Arctic is to move away from using fossil fuels for energy altogether. The most important thing we can do is vote with the climate in mind to let our leaders know we support a swift transition to renewable energy sources. In the meantime, we can directly participate in and learn more about our local and regional renewable energy options. We can all make a difference outside our own households by influencing where our energy comes from. We hope you leave here feeling inspired and return home to leverage your voice and your influence because together we can make sure that polar bears roam the Arctic sea ice for generations to come. So that's a great video. And while that was playing, I was collecting a lot of your questions and I just wanna start going through them now. So first of all, let's start with the question I got how or will polar bears adapt to climate change? So this is why we're concerned. We do know the climate is changing due to human driven factors like burning fossil fuels. Again, we know how to change that, that's great, but it's up to us how fast we can change and reverse that trend. In the meantime, the world is warming quicker than polar bears have ever experienced. So they are not going to be able to physically change in time, Polar bears reproduce slowly and they only have a couple babies at a time. And that process of a species physically adapting takes sometimes thousands of years, if not more. So they don't have time for that. We do know polar bears are adaptable in some of their behaviors. So we do see some polar bears, for example, take more advantage of dead whales as a food source that are washed up on shore. If polar bears have less sea ice, then they'll be stuck on land more. They're gonna look more at what's going on there. But Unfortunately, this isn't really an adaptation to climate change, and it's not a great one. It's just an option. What we're also seeing, which is not a great thing, is that polar bears who are spending more and more time on land because of less sea ice are entering communities more often. I did mention there's Arctic communities all throughout the north, and of course, any community has garbage and food and smells, and this is attracting hungry polar bears in when the bears haven't eaten for a very long period of time. And we are concerned about protecting both polar bears, but very much also protecting people and making sure both those groups stay safe. Uh, so one thing that we've done, for example, and hopefully you saw it, was we've helped create a coloring book for kids. A lot of kids live in these northern communities, and they want to go play out on the playground but if there's a polar bear around, it's not that safe. So I think that you guys have access to that coloring book. It's just kind of fun. Has some fun facts. Check it out. And with that, we're also working on another research project um, called Compact Surveillance Radar. It's a different type of radar, but basically we're using artificial intelligence to train a radar system and teaching it what a polar bear looks like. So this radar system can be mounted in a community and it can scan constantly. And if it detects a polar bear coming in from quite a ways away, it can warn the people in the community. It can turn a light on or sound an alarm or send a text message. And we're hoping that once we get this system better trained, that we will actually be able to send it out to other communities and give them ample warning when a polar bear is coming in. And this will hopefully make sure that they can just kind of direct the polar bear away, uh, or they can at least warn their people to stay inside. But with that, we had a couple of questions. So we had a question, what do polar bears hate? And what do they like? And I think these are two great questions. So they like seals, they like eating, and they like smelly stuff. Uh, so that's what's attracting them into towns. But what do they hate? Now, this is a good question. We are still learning about what polar bears hate. And this is actually something we discuss when it comes to this radar 
uh, project or when it comes to how do we keep polar bears out of communities? Is there something they don't like? And we don't really know. Uh, we do know for, they don't like super loud noises. So one of the strategies humans use right now is if they see a polar bear coming, they fire what's called a cracker shell. And that's basically a loud banger. You maybe have heard of bear bangers. You just, there are these little things, they fire a huge noise and the bear takes off. So we know they have sensitive ears. But we also are curious, are there any smells polar bears don't like? And that might be something that we're working on in the coming years is trying to find a smell that polar bears actually don't like and that they would avoid. Are there any smells that you really don't and you wouldn't go near where you smell it? Let me know in the chat if there's a smell that you really, really hate. And maybe we'll get ideas for our polar bear project. Okay, so our, we have a couple of questions about cubs. So I'll take a couple of those. Are the babies live when born? Well, let's talk about what polar bear cubs are like when they're born, because it's so interesting. Polar bears are the biggest bear species on the planet. They get so big because they eat seals. So you have this like giant mama polar bear in her den. She's maybe five, 600 pounds after being super fat, getting ready to be pregnant. And she gives birth to this tiny little two pound cub that's the size of a block of butter. The little babies are so, so, so tiny and they're blind and they're helpless and they can't walk. And they are just like, a little ball of furry nothing when they're born it's amazing but mama polar bear has really really fatty rich milk her milk is like would be like us drinking whipping cream it's got so many calories in it and so that cub will grow so fast in just three to four months that cub will go from two pounds to potentially 20 pounds which is amazing they grow so fast if you imagine a human baby being born at seven pounds and in just three to four months they're 70 pounds 10 times their body weight that would be terrifying for humans. But for polar bears, it's necessary because they only have a few months in their den for mom to nurse them and get them grown a little bit and get their legs healthy and working until they have to emerge from their den like we saw in that other video. So they have to eventually break out of their den. Mom needs to go eat some food. In some cases, she hasn't eaten for eight months at this point. Eight months without eating, can you imagine? Most of us don't even like skipping lunch. So mama polar bear needs to get back to that series and hunt seal, so her babies need to grow really, really fast. But we had another question about how old do they have to be to swim? And that's a really good question because these little babies, the cold water is too much for them. They don't have a body um, fat layer really yet. They hardly have any body fat. And so going into really icy cold water would be way too dangerous. So their mom really is trying to navigate away from open water, stay on the sea ice. It's not until the cubs are older that they'll swim a little bit. And often you'll see them hitching a ride on their mom's back. Um, but really even slightly older cubs aren't able to swim as much as adults. We know there was one case where a polar bear had to swim for over a week straight. She swam hundreds of kilometers. And when she did so, she started that trip with her yearling cub. So a cub that was just over a year old and the cub wasn't able to complete the trip with her and passed in that time. So it was just too much for that cub. So we do know that bears should be um, older and have a lot of body fat before they make these really long swims. They don't swim super fast. Um, I'm not sure like what rate you would call it, but they kind of just have this nice plodding swim. Um, but they do swim for a long time if they need to days on end. We did have a question about how fast they run though, and polar bears can sprint like crazy. They are not long distance runners, but they are faster than the fastest human sprint runner. So they would outrun Usain Bolt very easily. So that's why when we talk about polar bear safety, we say don't run away from polar bears or don't try to outrun polar bears because you will not be able to. They might look big and lumbering, but they are very, very fast. Okay, what's our next question? How long do they live? Great question. Polar bears are, the males and females have different lifespans. So males live into about their early 20s and females live into about their mid to late 20s. And this is because male polar bears, they have, they fight each other really hard. In the springtime, when it's time to fight for mates, they can really hurt themselves when they're fighting. And so males have a lot more inner injuries that they have to recover from. So they don't tend to live quite as long as the female polar bears. Um, but we usually expect a wild polar bear, hopefully, to be in their 20s, but in captivity, so that means in zoos, polar bears do live into their 30s, usually. And the oldest polar bear we ever know about, her name was Debbie, and she lived in Winnipeg, and she lived to 41 years old, which was the record so far. And how do we tag polar bears? 
also a very important question because of course we're not just walking up to a polar bear and putting a tag on it. So researchers have a very strict set of rules when we're going out to tag polar bears. So we do look for them in a helicopter. Um, we know where to go at certain times of the year in certain areas. We go up in a helicopter, we find them. If we find a polar bear that we want to study, we do dart it with a tranquilizer dart. And this puts the bear to sleep for about an hour. We make sure that the bear's uh, breath and heartbeat is monitored, its temperature is monitored, and that it's safe and comfortable and sleeping while we work. And we will measure the skull uh, width and the skull length. We measure the body length and the girth, so how, like, how fat the bear is. We might also take samples of fur or even a shaving of claw. We can learn a lot from furs and claws um, because they hold toxins in them. So if we take a sample of polar bear hair, even one hair, we can look at how much, for example, mercury is in that hair or how much cortisol, which is a stress hormone. So we can learn so, so much from these bears. And every bear that is handled is given a unique um, ear tag ID number. So in Canada, the number starts with an X. So we might have a bear that's X12345 for example, and every bear has its own number. So we have this, we call it the polar bear Bible and we bring it out with us in the field and we open it up and we see if this bear, you know, do we know this bear? Where was this bear caught before? Because every bear is in there with their own number. But for some bears, we will choose to put a tracker on them. And so again, that could be a GPS collar for females and those last about one to two years. And they're, um, they last pretty well when they are in the water, they're robust and they fall off automatically. Uh, whenever programmed, or we can choose to put a GPS ear tag. So males cannot be collared because they have like pylon heads and their necks are thicker than their um, heads, so they can slip collars off, but we can put one of these GPS ear tags in there on the bear. And that way we can follow bears and um, adult males and the younger bears. And we are also working on a project with 3M called the Burr on Fur Project. And we are trying to come up with a way where we can just simply stick an adhesive tag to the bear's fur. So do you know, have you ever been walking outside and you get little burrs stuck on your pants or clothes in the spring or summer, those little like seeds in there, just get in there. That's what we're trying to do with the tag. So just stick a, a tag on the fur and it gets stuck in there and then it falls off naturally when that polar bear molts or sheds its fur in the spring. So we're working on that technology too. There's still so much we don't know about polar bears. And again, the more we know, the better we can help them and the better decisions we can make um, about how to help polar bears. So I'm gonna take a look for more questions. Ooh, how long can they hold their breath for? I like this question because we have a pretty good answer to it. So the longest we know that a polar bear can hold its breath for is three minutes and 10 seconds. And that's way longer than I can hold my breath for. But we know this because we recorded, well, we scientists in Norway recorded a polar bear diving underwater for kelp. So when polar bears are very hungry, again, they want to eat seal blubber, but it's not always available. And so they want to fill their stomachs, you know, like us chewing gum or eating a Tic Tac or something. Polar bears do eat seaweed. And we see this in Churchill and we see this across the Arctic. So this polar bear was very hungry and he was diving for seaweed um, in the ocean and he was holding his breath for just over three minutes. So pretty great. Are the trackers compostable or do you collect them when they fall off? That's a really important question. We try to collect them whenever we can. They're not yet compostable. That would be an amazing feature. But almost always when we can get them back, we will, especially the GPS collars. We always try to retrieve those because if we do retrieve those, we can actually plug in a separate cord and download extra information that is not given to the GPS satellite. Um, the, the way the color works is it sends most of its information to the satellite, but some is just stored there. So if we can get it back, then we can download it. And you know, it's kind of funny when the color does drop off and we go find it, uh, you have like this beeper in your hand basically and it's beeping at you. And so you're walking around like the swamp, the swampy tundra trying to find where the color is buried. And sometimes it kind of gets pushed over or buried under something because other animals really like the smell of it because it's been on a bear for over a year. So it'll get really chewed up by, we don't really know, maybe a wolf in the area or something, but when we get them back, they're often pretty gross, but they're still usable. So we always try to get them back whenever we can. Um, how heavy is a polar bear? Yeah, so polar bears are very heavy. Males are, you know, 1,200 pounds, 1,500 pounds. I think the record was, um, maybe close to 2,000 pounds. Females are about half the weight of polar bears. So females are only half as big as the males. 
that's what I meant to say. Females are only half as big as the male. So an average female polar bear might be three to 500 pounds. When she's pregnant, she'll get a lot fatter. She has to pack on the weight to sustain a pregnancy and to go a long time without eating. Um, but the males are massive and heavy. And again, the biggest bears on earth. So they are just huge. And do newborn cubs eat seals? So the new newborn cubs in the den, of course, they only have their mother's milk. So for the first few months of life, they're only having milk. But as soon as they exit the den and they go to the ice and mom catches a seal, the little cubs absolutely try seal right away. They lick it and they'll chew on it a little bit. And from there, they get the taste for it and they learn that that's what polar bears eat. So as soon as they can. Um, how much bigger is a polar bear than a black bear? Oh my gosh, that's a good question. I don't even know if I can compare. That would be like comparing a, a Great Dane and a <laughs> and a beagle or something, <laughs> something like that. But black bears can be quite on the smaller side um, than a polar bear. So polar bears absolutely will could out wrestle a black bear any any day. And what is it like for polar bears in the summer? Oh, I love this question. Thank you, Nicole. So in the summer is a very different life for polar bears, depending on where you are in the world. But no matter, basically all over the Arctic. Um, the summer is the least eating time for bears. So it's a time where they're eating the least amount of food that they'll eat all year long. Now in some areas, polar bears do stay on sea ice all year long, um, but the, the really great, great sea ice tends to retract and the, the hunting decreases. In a lot of areas, what we see now is the summer means polar bears are coming on shore. And again, Hudson Bay, which I've talked about a couple times, that's a major place we see this happen. Hudson Bay is so ice free in the summer. All the bears come on shore in about July, sometimes late June, depending on when the ice melts. And they are trying to conserve their energy. So again, polar bears don't hibernate like other bears, but they still do need to conserve their energy because they need to go months without eating any food. So they take it really easy. Some bears go inland quite a bit. Some just hang out on the beach for a few months. They don't do a whole lot, to be honest. They walk around a little bit. Yeah, not not a lot. It's a really great time to kind of fly over and count polar bears. A lot of polar bear surveys are done at that time of year, late summer. Um, and then, of course, in the fall, which I've mentioned, as it starts to get cooler, you can kind of see the bears perk up and get, I don't want to say a little happier, but it sure seems like they're a little happier when it starts to get cooler. I'm sure they're a little more comfortable and they start congregating together. When it does cool down, we see sparring in the Churchill area occasionally. And this is basically play fighting with adult males. So they will wrestle. They become a little more active. You know, it's more comfortable temperatures and they're probably excited because they know that food's coming back sometime soon. But as soon as the sea ice is back, the bears are gone. Um, it often happens overnight. We'll go to sleep with polar bears outside our window and we'll wake up and there's no more polar bears for the year. They've all gone out to hunt. Okay, more, qu <laughs> more questions. Um, how much can an adult polar bear eat in a day? Love it. This again depends on the time of year. So if they had their way, um, they would eat a lot. And this happens in the spring. The spring is the biggest time of eating for polar bears. We call it hyperphagia, which basically means a lot of eating. And we kind of joke that for humans, hyperphagia happens around like Thanksgiving or Christmas when we tend to eat a lot more. But for polar bears, it's in the spring when the seals are pupping or having their babies. So in the spring, the seals give birth and that means there's a ton of baby seals all across the Arctic sea ice. And baby seals are not the smartest. They're so, so cute, but they're not the smartest. And so this means that polar bears have an easy hunting time and that they can gorge themselves on easy food. So polar bears at this time of year will eat. They can eat over 100 pounds of blubber in one sitting pretty, pretty slick if they wanted to. Um, so they eat a ton. But when we average out how much polar bears eat, so they have this huge eating period and then the summer where they might not eat for months and then other times of the year where maybe a seal here, a seal there, on average, they eat about one seal a week. Um, not again, there's different sizes of seal, but we like to peg if a polar bear had one seal a week all year, it would be in okay shape. So that's kind of our rough estimate. And if a polar bear had to fight a grizzly, who would win? So you might think it would be a polar bear. And maybe in some cases it would, because I'm going to really generalize here. Polar bears are bigger. But if you talk to most folks that have seen polar bear grizzly interactions, and a lot of bear biologists, Grizzlies tend to be meaner. So grizzlies that live in the north don't have a lot of food. 
uh, a lot of brown bears that live in the mountains and forests, they have more food and they're maybe like a little less inclined to be angry all the time. But northern brown bears, sometimes they have an attitude problem. And so we've actually seen it happen before. Um, people have seen it happen where you might have 20 polar bears eating a whale carcass and one grizzly bear comes in and the polar bears just kind of leave that grizzly bear alone. They don't want to fight it because the grizzly bear might be more aggressive. Again, this is a generalization very much depends on the bear's individual personalities and size and genders and all these things. But overall, we do think grizzlies tend to be a little more aggressive. That said, as a human, you don't want to have an encounter with either bear. Um, and so we definitely push bear safety and depending on where you are in the world, carrying bear spray and walking in a group and being loud and doing all the bear safe things, no matter what bear you're coming up against. But it is an interesting question. And I should say also, because people like this fact, polar bears and brown bears can mate with each other. It's happened a couple times that we know of. Uh, we call the offspring roller bears, um, just offhand, but we do know that there's been hybrid bears, brown polar bears up in the Arctic. Um, we think that most of them have since passed, uh, but there are pictures, they did exist. They weren't the most fit bear species for either land or ice. So it's not a great thing that there's a hybrid bear. It's not like some super bear species. It's kind of the opposite actually, um, but it's just a really interesting thing because polar bears did evolve from the brown bear. So they're still pretty closely related, even though they're very different. So they can still mate with each other, which we think is very interesting. Okay, more questions. Um, why do polar bears live in the Arctic? Uh, yeah, again, that's just, they adapted to live on Arctic sea ice and eat seals, and that's their main diet and their main source of food. And so they're very much an Arctic bear. We do get the question, could we just move polar bears down to Antarctica and they could eat the penguins? Um, you know, that would be really sad for the penguins. <laughs> uh, polar bears wouldn't do that great because in Antarctica, you have land covered with ice. And in the Arctic, you have water covered with ice. And so it's a very different hunting technique. And the seals in the Arctic um, are, you know, very aware of the polar bears and they've kind of adapted together and then in antarctica it would just kind of be a whole mess it would really mess up that ecosystem so we don't recommend that we do that um is their first soft or not you know it's not as soft as it looks i've seen a lot of pictures where it looks like oh that's a very soft bear it really is kind of um maybe like a, a German shepherd fur or something like it's a little bit coarse it's not bad but it's, it's not quite as soft as you might think definitely more of a coarser hair. And I think that probably helps keep it protected against the elements as well. So I'm just gonna take a handful more questions. I know you guys are, a lot of people are saying they're signing off for lunch or they're, we're getting to the top of the hour. Um, how long can they live without food? Good question. So the longest we know a polar bear can really go without food at this point regularly is the female polar bears that are pregnant and they go for eight months without eating, at least in the Western Hudson Bay population. So the female will mate in the spring. Um, she will come on shore in the summer. And if she's fat enough, then the pregnancy will stick. Um, if she's not fat enough or not healthy, then her body will flush the pregnancy because it, it can't take it to term. But if she's healthy, it'll stick and she'll go into the den in the fall, give birth in the winter and come back out in the spring. So yeah, if you do that math, that's eight months without eating for a pregnant polar bear. And that just is crazy, but they do it, but they have to get really 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 fat ahead of time and so how long are they pregnant for well about the same amount so they'll they get they meet in the spring and then if they're healthy enough by the fall then the pregnancy sticks and then it's a pretty short gestation from there on actually um, that means it doesn't take that long for the cup to grow because of course they only grow so so little until the the mom gives birth and then they grow really really fast and get a lot more robust um you guys are asking such great questions. Why do they have a short tail? That's a great question. Why do they have a short tail? Um, they've evolved to have a short tail. Most bears do. Um, actually, I think all bears do have pretty short tails. We think for the polar bear, it's kind of a bonus because a short tail means that you lose less heat. So it kind of helps uh, them keep their heat. And same with their ears. They have a short tail and short ears, and this helps prevent heat loss. So kind of a bonus. But most of them, most bear species, all bear species, well, some bear species have longer ears, that's for sure. Um, how many polar bears are in the world? Great. 
there's approximately 23,000 to 26,000 polar bears in the world right now. So it's very hard to count polar bears. Um, we have to, again, we share our information with other countries to try to tally up and we're always doing surveys to try to find out how many polar bears. So we think there's, yeah, roughly 25,000 in the world right now. But again, we, we could lose quite a few polar bears by the end of the century if we don't act on climate change and switch to cleaner energies and then help protect the polar bears that we do have. We do want polar bears to be healthy and robust and have great Arctic sea ice and great hunting and keep hunting seals as long as they can in the Arctic. And we want to be able to enjoy them. We want them to be roaming the Arctic um, as long as possible. So it's, yeah, thank you. I want to thank you guys too for all your interest and for everything you're doing for polar bears. And even the fact that you're watching this and learning a few facts about polar bears is just fantastic. Um, Oh, and people are wondering about if there's tame polar bears. You know, there's not really, we we don't recommend taming polar bears. Polar bears did used to be taken out of the wild occasionally and kept as pets or even taken to circuses back in the day. And that's really not a great life for a polar bear. There are polar bears in captivity now that do live much better lives and are very well taken care of. And there's a network of zoos and aquariums that we call our Arctic ambassador centers that take great care of their polar bears and have lots of amazing information and we share our information with them. And the polar bears um, sometimes are trained to help with certain um, like sampling things. So you can train a polar bear to lean against the fence and we can take a piece of fur or something like that. But they're not tame and they're not pets and they're not doing tricks or anything like that. They're, we try to keep them as polar berry as possible. But that's a really nice question. Um, yeah, it is, it is hard to count polar bears, but we do have a very good sense of where the polar bears are. And there's a whole network of researchers across the world who do a variety of different methods. Um, a lot include aerial, so we can fly helicopters or planes or drones over to count the polar bears. There's mark recapture programs where you mark a certain amount and then the next year you count how many came back and you do a lot of math to figure out how many polar bears there are and this is updated all the time so we do know for sure there's not millions but you're right it is hard to count but we're always looking um, at where the polar bears are and trying to do our best to count um how can polar bears swim so good so we're getting that question a lot so yeah they are so good at swimming so they have webbed feet that kind of act like paddles and they're kind of buoyant. So that means they're kind of floaty because they have so much body fat and they're so insulated by their fat. So that really helps them swim. So because they have so much fat and these big paddle feet and they steer with their back feet, their back feet kind of just float there but act like rudders. Um, the polar bear can keep going. They also have those long, beautiful necks and that helps keep their head out of the water. And they have a, a lot of strength and stamina so, to just keep going. So they're very much able to swim well and for long periods of time. Um, yeah, and they're great swimmers. And this will be the one last question and I really should wrap up because we're at the top of the hour and if Toby wants to say anything, I want him to be able to. Um, what? Why do they lie down so much? I love that. They, we do see them lying down a lot. So polar bears need to hunt. Um, they walk so much. They have some of the biggest home ranges of any animal and they are the most mobile four-legged animal, which means that of all the animals with four legs that walk around, the polar bears walk the most. They move huge distances. But when you exercise that much, you need to lie down a lot. So polar bears really only wanna walk when there's a payoff at the end, whether it's mates or food or something good. If there's not much going on, they're gonna conserve their energy, especially in the summer. So a lot of the stuff you see from us in the summer, or if you watch the polar bear live cams, the polar bears are laying down a lot. And it looks like they're being lazy, but really they're just resting up until they have to work really, really hard. So it is very cute that we see a lot of, we call them polar bear rocks on the landscape sometimes. So with that, I should wrap up. Thank you so much again. You guys had amazing questions. I wish I could have gotten to all of them, um, but maybe we can pass on some answers later. Please do check out polarbearsinternational.org, our website, so much polar bear information. We also have live events all week. Please take part in International Polar Bear Day if you're interested. We have so many materials. And thank you so much again to Telespark Science Center. It was so fun to do this with you guys today. Hopefully we can do it again in the future and answer even more questions. And yeah, thank you so much for your interest and for everything you are doing for polar bears. And I will throw it back over to you.